Pick two random numbers, x and y, in the interval 0 to 1. Then divide them y over x, and round the result to the nearest integer. What is the probability that you get an even number? What's your guess? Knowing nothing else, I'd probably guess 50-50 odds, so probability 1 half. Let's see if it checks out. Luckily, we live in the age of computers, so I'll get the computer to run through, I don't know, a good thousand quotients and see what we get. Well, on a first pass, it looks like we made a pretty good guess. The result is pretty close to 0.5. Still, we only tested a thousand quotients, so it's possible the true probability is close to, but not exactly 0.5. Let's run through some more quotients. Say, up to 10,000, and see if it zeroes in on 0.5, or if it stays a bit off. Well, that's interesting. Not only did it not get closer to 0.5, but actually dropped another hundredth. It's starting to look like the true probability is not quite 0.5, but actually a little bit less. Let's see if we can further confirm this by going up to 100,000 samples. Yeah, it's looking more and more that it really is somewhere around 0.46. You can see how the first two digits are no longer changing. All the change is happening further down now. Well, the obvious question now is, what the heck is this number? If it's not 0.5, then what is it? How can we figure it out? Well, as a mild spoiler, believe it or not, the answer actually involves pi of all things. Pretty weird, but honestly, on brand for pi at this point. He shows up everywhere. But he's actually not the only one showing up this time. Turns out, if we slightly change the problem to where, instead of rounding to the nearest integer, we instead always round down, the probabilities change, and we get e showing up in the formula instead of pi. So this one relatively simple sounding problem gives rise to both pi and e. Where are they coming from? And how do we even compute these probabilities anyway? To get started, it'd be helpful to have a good way to visualize the scenario we're dealing with. Since we're picking two independent random numbers in the range 0 to 1, this is equivalent to picking a random point in the 1 by 1 unit square in the xy plane. The collection of points that satisfy our condition, where rounding the ratio y over x gives an even number, will correspond to some region in the unit square. What will it look like? To start, it'll probably be easier to think about it if instead of asking when y over x rounds to any even number, we ask when it rounds to a particular even number, like, say, zero. What region of the unit square consists of points whose coordinates round to zero when you divide them y over x? Well, if a positive real number rounds to zero, it must mean that the number is less than one half, right? So this is equivalent to saying that y over x is less than one half. Multiplying all sides of this inequality by x tells us that y must be between 0 and 1 half x. On the graph, this corresponds to the triangular region of the unit square underneath the line y equals 1 half x. Since this triangle has area 1 fourth, and the entire unit square has area 1, the probability that the ratio y over x rounds to 0 is exactly 1 fourth. From here, we can do the same sort of thing to find the probability that y over x rounds to the other even numbers. For the even number 2, we get that y over x rounds to it if y over x is between 1.5 and 2.5, or 3 halves and 5 halves if written as fractions, which corresponds to the region of the unit square between the two lines y equals 3 halves x and y equals 5 halves x. If we treat the top of this triangle as its base, then we can compute its area as 1 half times its height of 1, times its base length of 2 thirds minus 2 fifths, which results in an area of 2 fifteenths. But actually, it'll be more helpful for figuring out our final answer if we unsimplify it back into its original form in terms of the x values, 2 thirds and 2 fifths. From here, we can keep on going, figuring out the region corresponding to rounding to 4, and then 6 and then 8, and so on. Each new number will add a new triangular region whose area we add to the probability. So 
so in the end, we end up with this infinite series representing the probability of getting any even number when rounding y over x. We can simplify it a little by multiplying in all the factors of 1 half. Some of you might recognize the part of the series in red here, especially if you've had a calculus class before. It looks very, very similar to another very famous infinite series, the one that goes 1 minus a third plus a fifth minus a seventh, plus a ninth, and so on, alternating adding and subtracting one over every odd number. It's a bit of a tangent to explain why, but it turns out this series sums to pi over four. And if I rearrange this equation slightly by subtracting one and taking the negative of both sides, we get that the red part of our probability series is one minus pi over four, or four minus pi all over four. And so, substituting it in, we get the probability of rounding to an even number is, despite all odds, 5 minus pi all over 4, or about 0.4646, which, if we compare to our empirical test with 100,000 rolls, lines up quite nicely. So yeah, beyond all expectation, the probability of rounding a random ratio to an even number involves pi. Pretty weird. Though if you've done enough math for long enough, you've probably gotten used to pi poking its head in places where it really feels like it has no business. But even so, usually once pi shows up in a problem, however unexpectedly, you'd kind of expect it to stick around even for variants of the same problem. Like if we change the problem to instead be about rounding a random ratio down to an integer, called taking its floor, I'd still expect pi to play a role, since it plays a role in such a similar related problem. But the surprise is that it doesn't. Instead, it vanishes, and the modified problem involves its seemingly distant cousin, e. Or, more specifically, the natural logarithm. The logarithm with base e. To see this, we'll approach the question the same way we did before. Instead of trying to figure out the probability that y over x floors to any even number, we'll compute the probability for particular even numbers, and then sum them all up. We'll start with zero. If the ratio y over x floors to 0, that means it's less than 1, meaning y lies between 0 and x. On the unit square, this corresponds to its lower triangular half, having area, and therefore probability, 1 half. From here, we can move on to the next even number, 2. If y over x floors to 2, then that means it must be between 2 and 3 which corresponds to points that are between the lines y equals 2x and y equals 3x in the unit square. This will have area 1 half times 1 half minus a third, which will add to our probability in progress. From here, the pattern continues how you'd think. Getting a ratio that floors to 4 corresponds to the triangle between y equals 4x and y equals 5x with area half of 1 fourth minus a fifth. The next triangle will have area half of 1 sixth minus the seventh, and so on. An alternating half sum of all the reciprocal natural numbers. Pulling out the common factor of 1 half from every term, we can simplify it a little to this. Now the question is, what is the sum of this infinite series? It can be a lot to take in, but something that might help is to see what this infinite sum looks like in sigma notation, and see if something jumps out at us. After the first term, the terms alternate plus minus 1 over n, starting with n equals 2. We can write this as a sum starting from n equals 2 and going to infinity of 1 over n times a factor of negative 1 to the power n to account for the alternating sign. Now, those of you who have had a calculus course might find this expression a little familiar. If your mind has recently been soaked in Taylor series, the sigma sum looks a lot like a Taylor series expression, just without its variable factor of x to the n. And indeed, you can choose to view the sigma sum as a Taylor series just with 1 substituted in for the variable x. This might seem like kind of a convoluted way of viewing the series. After all, we just introduced a variable where there didn't used to be one. Seems like an unnecessary complication. But introducing this seemingly unnecessary variable will actually be the key to deciphering what the series value is. Because once we put in a variable, like x, we now have a function we can analyze, and that means we can do calculus to it. 
If you look at the structure of the expression, it kind of looks like the result of taking an integral. Remember, the integral power rule says you increase the exponent of x by 1, and then divide it by the new exponent. So what do we get if we take a derivative? Well, we get something significantly simpler, an alternating series involving only powers of x. We can simplify it even further if I re-index the sum to start at n equals 1 instead of n equals 2. This produces negative 1 to the n plus 1 times x to the n. If we then factor out the extra negative sign contained in the negative 1 factor, we can combine it with the x to the n factor to get negative x, the whole thing, to the power n. This series should be pretty familiar looking if you remember your Taylor series from calculus. It almost perfectly resembles the Taylor series for 1 over 1 minus x. The only difference is being we have a negative x instead of x, a minus sign on the outside, and we're missing the n equals 0 term. But we can transform the vanilla x to the n series into our target series with a few simple transformations, allowing us to get a closed form formula for it. We can start by plugging in negative x in for x. Next, we can deal with the starting index by peeling off the n equals 0 term from the start of the series, which is just the constant 1 in this case, and moving it to the other side. Finally, we negate both sides, and voila! We have successfully reproduced our target series. So apparently, the derivative of the infinite power series we started with can be reduced to the relatively simple closed form formula 1 minus 1 over 1 plus x. We can then integrate it to get a closed form formula for the power series we started with. In this case, that'd be x minus ln of 1 plus x. Integration produces an unknown extra constant, of course, but we can solve for it pretty easily by plugging in 0 for x on both sides. In the series, this wipes out all the terms, leaving us only with 0, allowing us to solve for the constant c on the right-hand side. In this case, we get c is 0, so we can just delete it from the right-hand side. So we finally arrive at a formula for this infinite power series. Okay. Now let's remind ourselves why we did all this work in the first place. We found the probability of a random ratio flooring to an even number was given by this infinite series. The portion of that series beginning at 1 half can be written as the sigma sum of negative 1 to the n over n, going from n equals 2 to infinity. What we found, using the magic of calculus, is a formula for the sum of the series where each term is multiplied by x to the n. So to evaluate the actual series we care about, we can just plug in x equal 1 into this master formula, and we get that it equals 1 minus ln of 1 plus 1, or just 1 minus ln of 2. Substituting into the original expression for the probability, we get that it equals a half times 2 minus ln of 2, or just 1 minus half of ln 2, which is about 0 0.6534. So yeah! The probability of rounding a random ratio down to the nearest integer involves the natural log of 2, whereas the probability of such a ratio rounding either up or down to the nearest integer involves pi. This basically came about because both versions of the problem produced the same overall kind of infinite series, an alternating series of reciprocal integers. But yet, despite these two series being structurally similar, the seemingly subtle difference of whether we alternatingly add all reciprocal integers, or just reciprocal odd integers, is enough to change your answer from involving e to involving pi. By the way, you know that trick we used to evaluate the second series? Where instead of trying to evaluate it directly, we extended it into a function which we could analyze with the tools of calculus? That function has a special name when used for this kind of purpose. It's called a generating function because it's a function that has kind of encoded or generates the terms of our series, in this case in the coefficients of its Taylor expansion, that is, in its derivatives. Generating functions can be extremely powerful tools for dealing with problems involving sequences and series, and they're really cool to see in action. You got to see a small taste of them here, but they really deserve a whole video of their own. Using generating functions to find the value of an infinite sum like this one always feels a bit strange to me, because it seems like we're just making the problem more complicated by inserting an x into the series and turning it into a function. 
because now we're dealing with infinitely many possible series, one for each value of x, instead of just our original single series, which we get for plugging in x equal 1. It's like buying a whole house just to get the hose that's attached to it. Seems like overkill. Except that's the weird thing about math. Sometimes solving a general problem is easier than solving a specific case of that problem. And generating functions are a pretty good example of that. 